Hi, everyone. Welcome to this special webinar on a new research report released just yesterday that explores the question, is America ready to unleash a multi-generational force for good? We've been waiting for this day for a very long time, and we're really glad that you joined us. I'm Eunice Lynn Nichols. I'm co-CEO of Encore.org, a national nonprofit that brings older and younger change makers together to solve problems, bridge divides, and co-create the future. I've been part of this work for about 20 years now. I was 26 when I joined Experience Corps, a program created by our founder and co-CEO, Mark Friedman. It was designed to mobilize a critical mass of older adults to help kids read by third grade. And I saw the magic happen every day between my volunteers and those kids, but there was something else happening at the same time. At a critical juncture in my transition into adulthood and my early career, I and my young staff were surrounded by people 30, 40, 50, 60, and 70 years our senior. And together we became a team, a multi-generational force for good, turning schools into places that felt more like extended family. Over the years, I've become a part of a special band of change makers who got their start in this work as young people who love collaborating with older people to change the world. Mark Friedman was in his 30s when he partnered with renowned social innovator John Gardner, then in his 80s, to create Experience Core and this organization. And today we'll be sharing the stage with Dr. Cal Halverson, who first joined Encore at the age of 24. Like me, Cal spent the formative part of his early career working on a multi-generational team to build our organization's capacity to do groundbreaking research on the emerging Encore movement, including the impact of Encore talent on schools, the nonprofit, the nonprofit sector, and the field of social innovation. I don't think I'm overstating things when I say it's been one of our organization's greatest joys to watch Cal grow in his leadership in our field and beyond. Today, he's an assistant professor at the Boston College School of Social Work and an affiliate at the Center on Aging and Work. He was part of the inaugural class of Encore Public Voices Fellows where he honed his thought leadership and public scholarship. And I was thrilled when Cal agreed two years ago to return to Encore as a senior fellow supporting our new body of research and evaluation focused on bringing older and younger change makers together to bridge divides and solve problems. All that to say, Cal, Mark, and I, and many of you have known in our bones for decades, the power and joy of collaborating across generations. We started out as young people who love working alongside older people, and over time, we're becoming the older adults in the room who love working with young people. But just because we've each experienced the secret sauce of co-generational action doesn't mean it's a thing. In fact, a recurring question we fielded over the years from older generations is, I'm not sure younger people actually wanna work with me. And we've likewise heard young people question if older adults have a genuine interest in being their allies. And perhaps the most pesky question of all, if intergenerational collaboration is such a game changer, why isn't it happening everywhere? As Encore charts a path forward in the most age diverse society we've ever seen, it's high time we got some answers to those questions. So with the generous support of AmeriCorps seniors, the M Center for Excellence, the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, and the John Templeton Foundation, we commissioned a study to find out if older and younger people actually wanna solve the nation's problems together. Cal has been a central member of our team, helping us dig into the research to understand its impl implications. And I'm so glad he's with us today to walk us through what we found. So over to you, Cal. Wow, well, thank you so much, Eunice. That was a really kind introduction. Uh, and it has been so much fun uh, working with you and, and Mark and the great folks at Encore.org again uh, over the past couple of years. I feel so lucky to have launched my career at Encore.org. So I'm thrilled to be here today uh, to talk about Encore.org's important new research. So Encore partnered with NORC at the University of Chicago to gauge how American adults think about working across generations to solve the country's problems. NORC conducted a survey using its AmeriSpeak platform, which many researchers and journalists consider to be one of the most accurate panel studies around today. It's a scientific sample, and it's much more robust than the convenience samples that are often used, especially in the nonprofit sector. In other words, it's highly representative of the overall population of adults in the US. Households are randomly selected using advanced statistical and honestly time-consuming uh, methods resulting in a sample coverage of approximately 97% of the US household population. And for this project, NORC surveyed 1,549 respondents, so over 1,500 respondents aged 18 to 94, both online as well as for inclusion purposes by phone in March of 2022. 
the data tell a powerful story of a largely untapped multi-generational force for good. So today I'm gonna to walk you through some of the key data findings and then help to facilitate a discussion with Encore's co-CEO, co-CEOs, Mark Friedman and Eunice Lynn Nichols. This discussion will be a Q&A. So please post your questions to the Q&A section of our Zoom window and we'll uh, keep tabs of that. So we asked people about their experiences and their interest in working with others 25 years younger or older than themselves to make the world a better place. This work could be in any capacity, such as volunteering, getting involved in an issue that they care about, or working in a paid job. And you'll see that we presented the results by generation using definitions provided by the Pew Research Center. So who are these generations? Gen Z includes people who were between the ages of 18 to 25 years old in March. Millennials were 26 to 41, Gen X, 42 to 57, boomers, 58 to 76, and the silent generation, 77 and older. And we worked with NORC to make sure that we had ample representation in each of these generations. And what emerged is a fascinating story with some important commonalities and divergences and some surprises. We found that people of all ages say they want to work across generations to help others and improve the world around them. In fact, more than four fifths of respondents say that they want to work with others, either 25 years older or younger than themselves to improve the world around them. Now, while interest is widespread, young people, as well as black and Hispanic people of all ages are especially keen to work across the generations. And this fit is a powerful one. Young people want to learn from older ones, Older people want to share what they know, and importantly, vice versa. Older and younger people want to work together on some of the same issues, but there are striking differences by both age and race. And finally, despite strong interest in working across the generations, fully half of respondents cited a range of obstacles preventing them from acting upon it. So let's dig into the data just a little bit more. We all see plenty of headlines about generational divides. And this survey found a very different picture than that. People of all ages want to work across generations to help others and improve the world around them. In fact, more than four fifths or 80.6% to be exact of respondents say that they want to work with others 25 years older or younger than themselves to improve the world around them. More than half of all generations strongly agree that working together is important because it helps generations better understand each other, enriches the lives of older and younger people, and produces better solutions. As shown in the top bar here, well over half strongly agree that America can better solve its problems if younger and older people work together. Another 36.4% somewhat agree. And as shown in the bottom bar, just over half strongly agree that we would be less divided as a society, if older and younger generations worked together more often, another 41.3% somewhat agree. Nearly half of respondents have worked for change in the past year with someone at least 25 years older, and almost 40% have worked with someone at least 25 years younger. Almost 80% of those who worked with someone at least 25 years older, and then again, more than 70% of those who have worked with someone at least 25 years younger said that their experiences were positive or very positive and about half of people who haven't co-generated yet are interested in doing so in the future. Now, when we dug more deeply into this widespread interest in working across the generations, we found that while interest is widespread, young people and Black and Hispanic people of all ages are especially keen to work across the generations. For example, nearly three quarters of respondents wish that they had more opportunities to work across the generations for change. Gen Z respondents were the most likely to say this. As shown in the left chart, Gen Z respondents are almost twice as likely to be motivated by the opportunity to work across generations as our silent generation respondents. And as shown in the right chart, both black and Hispanic respondents are almost twice as likely as white and Asian respondents to be motivated by this opportunity. The youngest respondents and people of color are also those most ready to act on this enthusiasm. Looking at the prospect of working for change with others at least 25 years older than themselves, more than half of Gen Z respondents say that they are very likely to do so in the next few years. This sense of urgency does decline with older age groups. Interest in doing this work someday is more than 10 percentage points higher among Black and Hispanic respondents and more than five percentage points higher among Asian respondents in comparison to white respondents. And half of Black respondents and close to half of 
Hispanic and Asian respondents say that they are very likely to do so in the next few years, compared to about a third of white respondents. Interest in someday working for change with others at least 25 years younger is more consistent across age and racial groups. But Gen X and Black respondents appear most likely to act on this interest. Almost half of Gen X respondents say that they are very likely to do so in the next few years, significantly more than older respondents. And similarly, more than half of Black respondents say that they are very likely to do so in the next few years, which was much higher than among Asian, Hispanic, and white respondents. So let's turn to the reasons why people value co-generation. The fit is a powerful one. Young people want to learn from older ones and older people want to share what they know and vice versa. Across the board, respondents' top reasons are learning, sharing their knowledge, and increasing their appreciation for other generations. And importantly, the learning and sharing knowledge dynamics are strongly two-way. For Gen X and Boomer respondents, the top reason they had a positive experience working with people at least 25 years younger than themselves include that it allowed them to share what they knew. The orange puzzle piece shows the statistic for Boomer respondents. Almost three quarters of silent generation respondents said that they had a good experience working with younger people because it increased their appreciation for younger generations. And among those who have worked for change with people at least 25 years older than themselves, about two in five of Gen Z, half of millennials and half of Gen X respondents said that the experience was positive because it increased their appreciation for older generations. Nearly two thirds of Gen Z respondents and about half of millennial and Gen X respondents say it taught them something that they would not have otherwise have learned. The blue puzzle piece shows this statistic for Gen Z respondents. So now let's turn to the what. Older and younger people want to work together on some of the same issues, but there are striking differences by age and race. As shown in the bar chart on this slide, mental health topped the list of priority co-generation issues among younger respondents. More than half of Gen Z and millennial respondents said that they want to work across generations on mental health. In this topic, mental health did not make it into the top five issues cited by boomer or silent generation respondents. The environment came first among older generations. The environment also did make it into the Gen Z top five. Education was the only issue all generations included in their top five. Both education and mental health are among the top five issues for all racial groups as well, but some stark differences also appeared. Black respondents, for example, cited racial justice more than twice as frequently as white respondents did. Healthcare and caregiving was cited by more than half of Asian respondents, but only about a third of white respondents. Housing and homelessness was cited by more than half of black respondents, but fewer than a quarter of Asian respondents. So what's holding back this multi-generational force for good? Despite the strong interest in working across generations, fully half of respondents cited a range of obstacles preventing them from acting upon it. Unsurprisingly, about 20% of respondents cited COVID-19 as a current obstacle to working across the generations for change. More surprisingly, every generation selected that they can't find opportunities to work with people of other generations as a top obstacle. This is shown in the bar chart on the screen. And all but the oldest respondents also said that they don't know how to get started. The youngest and oldest respondents cited difficulty communicating with people from other generations as a top five obstacle as well. But that response was more than two times stronger among Gen Z respondents as it was among silent generation respondents. In fact, Gen Z respondents were the most likely to cite non-COVID barriers to working across the generations, say that they don't know how to get started working with people of different generations, and say that they find it difficult to communicate with people of different generations. Another highly cited obstacle was generational differences in values. Lastly, we found that persistent age segregation likely plays a role here. More than a quarter of all respondents strongly agree with the statement that they would like to spend more time with people of different generations who are not in their families, and almost 60% somewhat agreed to that. Yet more than 40% said that they had not spoken seriously in the past year with non-family members of other generations about a social, community, or political issue. And almost half of them said that this was because they don't spend much time with people of other generations. So that is a very high level view of this fascinating data set. And so now what I would like to do is open the floor to insights about all of this from Mark and Eunice. So I'd like to start the ball rolling by asking this uh, to Mark and Eunice, 
what were your biggest aha moments when looking at this research? What surprised you or perhaps relieved you uh, by these results? And, and how do these findings tie into the trends that you've been tracking? Uh, may, maybe I'll jump in, Cal. Thank you so much for distilling the report. In fact, I every time I hear you go through those findings, I feel like I get a greater understanding. Um, I, I, you know, I when you ask the aha, I, I, a whole set of things both shocked and surprised me, and also on further reflection, seemed utterly obvious. <laughs> so, I with that qualification. But I think to start. Um, the uh, deeper interest on the part of young people. I think if you were certainly to ask older people um, in an era of OK Boomer and these charged uh, generational, you know, insults, um, I, I, I don't think people would uh, expect that that young people would be so interested in doing this. And in fact, I think that. The numbers probably underestimate the interest on the part of older people who are self-protecting, who, who don't think they're wanted, don't think that the younger generation is interested in working with them. And it reminds me of uh, a message that came out when we had the opportunity to do a panel discussion for the National Conversation Week with the folks from Millennial Action Project and Bridge USA. And what Layla Zeldane from Millennial Action said in that is, you know, first of all, um, um, we we don't like the idea of older people who've presided over these issues for the last 40, 50 years, uh, you know, exiting the stage and saying to us, okay, well, uh, solve them and uh, we're all with you. <laughs> but then Layla shifted and, and I think um, this is equally true is there's a recognition among young people in their wisdom that no one generation can solve any of these problems. And so um, there's a, a call to action coming from from young people to the older generation saying let's let's join. And I think related to that is, a potential coalition for the future, which is surprising in some ways. You know, we think of young people as being the ones most interested in the future since they're going to live in that period. But we know from developmental research that generativity is the hallmark of, of thriving in later life. Eric Erickson used the expression, I am what survives of me to capture that. And when you look at issues like education, environment, climate, uh, where there's a convergence, um, you can see the the makings of this coalition to co-create a better future. Maybe it's not it's not uh, co-generation; it's co-generativity. So I'll I'll stop with that, and and um, I'm really curious, Eunice, what what jumped out to you as a an aha? Um, I, you know, I, similar to you, the this clear data saying that young people are leading the way, though I think we probably should not be surprised. Um, for me, I wanted to lean into some of the questions we've actually seen pop up in the chat box in the Q&A um, around some of the insights around who is who is eager to, to co-generate. And uh, I think, Ernest, you raised some interesting questions about the difference between what um, uh, younger people and um, people of color in particular are interested in digging into. Uh, that was surprising to me, actually, to well, not the part of young people being interested in, in digging into mental health, um, but older people being most motivated by uh, the environment. And so I think often we, we think that that is uh, one of the most divided issues of young people are doing the work. I think if there's a real opportunity for older and younger to work together. We've been tracking work um, of interesting organizations like Third Act with Bill McKibben. Um, he's mobilizing people en masse, 50, 60 years and older, to be allies to young people. I think that also highlights um, some other comments in the thread about the mutuality of older and younger together. Um, we're seeing people like Bill lead in a way that says, while we have lived experience, we also are learning from young people, their methodologies of organizing, and we have to come together. Uh, with no one generation alone is going to get this done. Um, so I think the idea of co-generation is very uh, two-way. Um, I do think, though, the fact that our survey seemed to indicate that older people felt they had something to learn and young people wanted to learn 
um, might also have something to do with just our lack of imagination that we sit in a, in a culture that has told us forever that old people are the teachers, young people are the learners. And of course, we'd walk into older age with that mentality and young people same, similarly when answering survey questions. So I am curious as we launch a body of a more ambitious co-generational work, both on the imagination side and the innovation side, if in five or 10 years, we might actually have people in a different mindset when they answer those questions. Um, so I'm just kind of, you know, digging into the, the, the mentality of the person who's answering the survey. So um, I'll toss it back to you, Cal, because I feel like you sit in a, a unique position of um, being a, an academic, a researcher, but also a social worker. Uh, what trends were interesting to you? And obviously, if you have any comments on some of the, the questions that are coming up around the data cut by race or gender or otherwise, we'd love to hear from you on that too. Oh sure, you know, you know, sitting like being in academia has been has been uh, fascinating for me, and it's a, it's a major shift from from uh, you know the very dynamic environment at at Encore.org. And, and one thing I, I appreciate about academia is the multi generational mentorship that's occurring for me. That's even been set up for assistant professors uh, to succeed. So even in my own type of job, um, it's it's there. We don't always call it multi generational. It might be multi multi stage, for example. Uh, different different types of jobs, but it's been really helpful. And you know, in terms of the academic research on this, even in peer-reviewed journals, there's not much out there. But I did want uh, to to call out the the Journal of Intergenerational Relationships. They have been doing this type of research for years. Uh, the Journal of Gerontological Social Work uh, publishes a lot of research about intergenerational programs uh, and issues. Um, and there's some there's some pretty exciting researchers out there that are doing this work too. For example, Shannon Jarrett at the Ohio State University College of Social Work does a ton of intergenerational research. And, and I know you've worked closely with the following program that I'll, that I'll mention, Opening Minds Through Art, which is at the Scripps Gerontology Center at Miami University in Ohio. But they have some pretty cool research coming out of their program now uh, that is an intergenerational arts program for people uh, living with uh, dementia. And they happen to be a Gen to Gen Innovation uh, Fellow. But one of the key gaps that I've found in this research, because there, there is, I, would, I wouldn't say there's a bunch, but there's, there is uh, still some research on intergenerational programs, especially older people serving younger ones. For example, the Experience Core research uh, that is so amazing, as well as younger people serving older people. There is a gap in the research on an older and younger people working together uh, to solve social problems that may have little or nothing to do with age or that may transcend age. For example, working together on climate change or racial justice, so, so, social isolation, um, and more. Um, I did want to touch on one question. I saw that uh, I'm, I, it's already, I've already missed who's, who's written it, but one of the questions was regarding climate change in the environment. So the, the issue areas uh, in the survey and how did we differentiate between those? Uh, and the, the, the clear, honest answer to you is we did not differentiate between those. We asked both of those as, as separate issues uh, that people could respond to. And we wanted to just see how they played out. And what was interesting is that among the younger generations, climate change uh, seemed to be more salient or was more important to them. Uh, for example, among Gen Z respondents, 44.7% uh, said that they would love to work cogenerationally uh, toward climate change. Uh, that's barely different at all from the same number of, uh, of excuse me, I'm looking at the wrong, uh, there we go. 40.5% uh, of, of Gen Z respondents said climate change and 40.8% uh, said the environment. Uh, but when you look at older generations, it was mostly uh, the environment. Uh, there were some pretty big gaps there, uh, but climate change was still pretty high up, for example, even if you look at the silent generation. And so I am going to pass it back uh, to Eunice because I actually did want to check in with you because you've been managing and launching cogenerational initiatives uh, for more than 20 years. So uh, what can actually be done to address some of these obstacles we talked about, such as people saying that they can't find these opportunities or they're struggling to communicate uh, with people of different generations or their values may differ or they just don't even know how to get started? Yeah, um, I appreciate that question. And I'll... I'll quote uh, from one of my mentors, Mark Friedman, 
who often says that we are living in an age segregated society because of innovation uh, and out of efficiency, we created the silos of older and younger. And that one solution is to point that innovation back at this problem and to, to bring generations back together. So a lot of the work I've been doing is supporting and tracking innovators who are trying to do just that. Uh, bridge the, the divides and bring older and younger together. Um, you know, obviously some things that are needed there is um, to, to have people see this as a viable body of work to do, um, to have research back it up and show that when it happens, not only is the thing being addressed, whether it be affordable housing or reading by third grade or climate action, not only do those things um, improve in terms of impact, but that there's this additional benefit that happens between the older and younger working together uh, that is uh, difficult to describe, but I think the three of us have experienced it, that the work is um, more enlivening, more joyful, we can stay the course, um, that we learn more older and younger together. Um, I do need to make a nod also to the fact that Mark and I had a momentous week. Last week, uh, we stepped into a co-CEO role together and um, you know that's not fundamentally about succession planning. That's actually about the diversity of views, what we bring because we are from different generations, different lived experience, uh, different perspectives, even though we actually have so much in common in some ways around our passion for bringing older and younger together. Um, but even that co-generational leadership model, I see reflected in the results of this research report. Um, I think I have wanted uh, for so long to work in an environment where we were leading in more of a communal collective way. Um, I think Mark and many other leaders have had one model of the lone leader at the top. It's not sustainable. It doesn't feel healthy. And I look at even young people calling out mental health. Um, our structures, including the way we run organizations, doesn't allow always for uh, the spaciousness to be creative and to do the work. So I think Mark and I are as interested in leaning into what this means for the workforce as we are for what it means for the work out there. Now, Mark, if you want to say a couple words on that too. Yeah, well, there, there's this very provocative study that Cal, I, I suspect you and some of the other people tuning in have seen from BMW, which has these three assembly lines, one of older workers, one of younger workers, and the mixed line. And the one of older workers is uh, uh, plotting but makes few mistakes. Uh, the, of younger workers is uh, fast but uh, error prone. And then the combined line is the best of everything. So I guess this may mean that um, I'll be plotting and making few mistakes while Eunice will be speeding ahead. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, I think that the, you know, the metaphor of bringing different generational perspectives together, you know, not not just um, uh, for efficiency, but to model how we make the most of this multi generational society that is already washing over us. We're the most multi generational, most age diverse society, arguably in human history. Um, new research from Stanford shows that there are essentially the same number of people from birth to 70 at every age, 57, 12, 31. And we've got to um, we've got to figure out how to navigate that new terrain, partly to avoid some of the problems, but most of all, because there's a huge opportunity. And yet, when you were going over the findings, Cal, that number 40% of the people have never had any contact with somebody of a different generation over the past year. You know, and there are a whole other set of numbers. And there were a reminder, you know, as Eunice was pointing out about the prevalence of age segregation. I think with that much age segregation, we've almost forgotten how to, um, to interact with other generations. I think Gen Z raise that point that they don't know how to communicate with older people. And so, you know, it's a picture of a lot of pent up demand, but um, abject segregation and also few creative opportunities relative to the need and, um, to come together. On the more positive side, um, and I'm curious if you're seeing this as well, you know, you could look at the, these findings and say, oh, this is so positive, it's Pollyanna, you know, uh, let's all break out into, you know, a rousing rendition of Kumbaya. <laughs> um, but I, I was struck, first of all, by the, the number of people who had the strong, had strong interest in doing this, but most of all, how this fits into a pattern that's little acknowledged, right? We just, uh, 
came off a, a you know a television and music award season where uh, hacks and only murders of the building which are now in their second season depicting just what this study is is showing is winning all the awards um uh, lady gaga and tony bennett there's a kind of zeitgeist shift in the popular culture in this direction pew who was already in vogue pew research has just shown that 60 million americans are living in multi-generational households a fourfold increase that has spanned economic ups and and downs so i think this is another piece of a an emerging pattern that um is at odds with the way things have been over the last 50 hundred years but actually completely congruent with the millennia that preceded that i might um dwell for a second mark on uh you had mentioned intergenerational housing and i think there i saw a question or two on sort of the the trends at some point kind of fell out of uh popularity but seems to be having a resurgence and um, and, you know, I think it, it's interesting to think about how the pandemic has probably impacted that, I mean, all of this in some ways, but uh, as we, all of us descended into um, to physical isolation, I know I looked with longing at some of my friends that were living in multi-generational households already and feeling like, oh my goodness, um, they already had community built in before we got separated. And I know, Mark, you moved into a multi-generational situation yourself. Um, during the during the pandemic as well, there's there's just a lot of ways in which uh, the systems work when you have older and middle and younger coexisting together. Uh, I also want to point out that that's something that I think um, a particular kind of Western mentality has promoted this being independent and individual. But there's a lot we can learn from communities of color, in particular, and immigrant communities, um, black communities where. Uh, older and younger are still somewhat in touch with one another. Uh, and some of this, I think even this research might seem befuddling to them because they're already living that way. Uh, we even have silos on who we're learning from and the case studies that we're highlighting and who's in touch with whom. So I'm equally interested in how we make sure that we're looking at um, the fullness of all the stories that are out there. Mm -hmm. And we did receive um, one question in the Q and A, you know, uh, are there hints from the research on ways to encourage crossing uh, these these lines of interest by by age, also racial, ethnic groups, uh, and and so from the from the research, you know, some of the hints would be at the kind of the what questions we ask, like what topics would you be interested in, and for you know one of the examples there would be education, just because uh, education was so important regardless of age, it was important by among many um, by by race. Uh, and ethnic groups, um, you know, mental health, even though it topped for the younger generations, uh, you know, it was not, uh, it was not super low among the older generations as well. So there was a divide, but there's still some interest there. And, you know, one of the things I want to mention here is when you're asking a survey like this, we only have so much time. And so we had 10 minutes to get all of these questions in uh, to NORC uh, for, for the survey to take. And so, you know, moving forward, I would love to ask more qualitative or contextual research where we're actually interviewing folks, having fo focus groups, uh, going out into the community to see what types of co-generational work that they're doing and what, and, and what they're interested in doing moving forward, because that could really add some important nuances and context uh, to our findings. But, but Eunice and Mark, did you, you know, given your work at Encore over the years and, and your, your work with so many other organizations nationally, have you seen you know, examples of ways that that organizations are helping to bridge both these age and racial divides uh kind of touched on by this by this research do you want me to go first mark or do you want to jump in um i think something that we've been tracking a lot uh over the last two years in the pandemic is i think the role of technology um both the barriers for young people and older people um, in accessing certain kinds of technology and the need to level set there because it has been a way for um for connection to happen, especially for those who are living in physical isolation. Um, we've been uh, really excited to see the number of young people that have launched kind of technology startups and are uh, willing to break down traditionally what we think is possible um, to, to have platforms where older and younger can connect, sometimes for social, uh, you know, just more for social conversation, um, even for tutoring. The program that I started with uh, 
when I was in my younger part of my career experience core has always been in person. Um, it's been, I would have said, that's the secret sauce is you have to be in person. I could not have imagined experience core in a virtual setting. Um, we all had to get really scrappy. And I think one interesting piece when, um, when that program had to move online is younger staff members and um, national service members stepped up and trained and collaborated with volunteers in a new way to create a new kind of workforce to move online. Um, we learned older adults are eager and excited to get online, to learn that technology for, and they'll do it for the volunteer opportunity or for the work at hand. The side benefit is then they learn the technology to be connected with family and neighbors elsewhere, um, but they won't always be motivated to do that just for what appears social, um, highly motivated when it's kind of their job. And so um, what we saw was also a, a group of older volunteers who would find it difficult to engage physically, um, to go to school in the winter when it got dark and or were experiencing health issues, would have to step out of volunteering. Um, the virtual piece actually allowed them to stay engaged. And once again, to feel like they had um, colleagues working with them on an important cause. So um, I think technology has been interesting to track to both see where it's been a challenge, um, but also where it's been a real boon during these times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to pick up on what you were saying, Eunice, um, I, I am uh, addicted to alliteration. So, uh, you know, as I try to, to do a close reading of these findings, which is always a little perilous uh, when, you know, as you were saying, Cal, it's just 10 minutes worth of questions to people. But the three Ps that jumped out at me were proximity, purpose, and posterity <laughs> that are kind of interwoven between all of this, the, you know, the need for more daily contact between people of different generations. Um, you know, another P is practice. I think we're just out of practice in these kinds of, um, but even at, the, at a higher level, the opportunity around shared purpose, um, work together that um, matters to both generations. And there are a lot of great indicators of where that might reside. Um, and best of all, maybe at the highest level is proximity and purpose in service of the future, that coalition for the future uh, posterity. Um, and it, again, education and the environment being such natural hallmarks of, of that. It, I also felt there was a glimmer in there of hope around the idea of bridging other kinds of divides. John Powell, who runs the Center for Othering and Belonging, co-hosted a, a pilot podcast that we did last year. And he talked about this generational uh, connection as being a short bridge in a society where there are a lot of long bridges. And I think it may be a way where we can make some genuine progress, even across political lines. I, I think of um, Ben Sass, the conservative Nebraska senator, wrote a book, The Vanishing American Adult, a few years ago, in which he included a whole chapter on fighting age segregation. And when you extract quotes from Ben Sass's chapter and compare them to Maggie Kuhn, the great rabble rouser who founded the Gray Panthers, you know, probably uh, Kuhn and Sass would agree on very little, but you could, you'd be hard pressed to, to uh, uh, figure out which quote from, is from Maggie Kuhn and which from Ben Sass. So I, I think that there is some common ground here that can um, be built upon. Um, I also feel like um, when we when we think about this sort of secret sauce of older and younger coming together, we can easily assume if you just toss toss them together, it will work out well. Um, and in some ways, my my big fear is. Uh, a rallying of everybody to to bring older and younger together without without the without thinking through the structures and the scaffolding that needs to happen for that to go well because we have been so segregated because there are significant stereotypes because there are generational differences <clears throat> and so I see in the in the chat box a lot of people saying what are the you know who's out there helping to train or to provide curriculum for older and younger together there's a lot there's a lot out there um, probably a few of my colleagues could stick in there um, we just heard from some of our friends at Ya Impact who have been working on developing um, intergenerational dialogue guidance for um, conversations about climate change. Um, there's uh, an organization we've worked with um, called the um, the Dinner Party that is 
focused on bringing older, they did a pilot project to bring older and younger people experiencing grief and loss to have conversations to bridge that divide. Um, we have, uh, there's a, a program called Living Room Conversations that's training people to have conversations as if in a living room across all kinds of topics. So it doesn't take much to go and find some guidance, but my, my, um, my call for all of you would be to say, uh, use what's out there, um, guided conversations are helpful, um, rooting initial conversations, not necessarily even in a topic, but just life stories and understanding who the person is sitting with you um, is I think a fast track to then actually collaborating on work out there together. Um, sometimes tackling a hot topic head on is not the best way to, to bridge that short, that short divide that you called out, Mark. Um, I uh, the, the questions in our chat box have been flowing. And so I've been just kind of dabbling here and there. I wanted to point out one question that might be for you, Cal, but it might need to be a like save for later, uh, follow circle back answer. Um, I think it was uh, when somebody asked if we cut the data at all by gender. And I'm curious if you had any thoughts on that. I would love to. We have not yet. Uh, this is very fresh data, and we wanted to get it out as soon as possible for this report, but we have not yet done it by gender, but we have that variable. And the other thing I want to say, too, is for, for researchers out there, uh, we are making this research available to you. So um, all you have to, on, on the, uh, the Encore.org slash cogenerate website, there's, there's information there for how you can uh, request, the, uh, request the data. So hmm. short answer, we have not done it, but we plan to. That's great. Um, I might ask you another question, Cal, because uh, you you are uh, a professor and interacting regularly with young people. You should say assistant I, professor. Assistant professor. Oh, <laughs> you're still professor to me. Uh, yeah. I was just at my 25th college reunion, and a topic as I reconnected with some of my professors that I haven't seen for two decades um, was about the shift in young people and their mental health as they arrive in yeah. colleges. And I'm curious if you've seen or have a perspective on what older and younger can do together to support one another around mental health. Um, I don't know, are there any pointers in that? I feel like Encore, we're actually pretty early stage in figuring out what we can do and what we can support in that yeah. area. You know, that's that's an incredibly important question. And, and it's something that I've seen firsthand, um, even, even in my time, just comparing pre, uh, pre-pandemic, I guess I don't say post-pandemic, but to now, um, there's, there's been a huge change in the mental health of my own, of my own graduate students. Um, and so, you know, it has actually affected how I teach and how I check in with them. So uh, just, you know, a lesson learned for me is I'm regularly checking in uh, with, with all of my students. I make it very clear in class to, to reach out to me if there's any issues. Communication is highly valued in my class. And I regularly work with a lot of my students, uh, frankly, just to make sure that they're doing okay. So then they can then uh, do the learning and the, the, you know, the papers and all of that stuff in my class. And I've talked with a lot of my colleagues, not only at Boston College, but throughout the country. Uh, and this is, this is, this is a trend and it's, it's, it's kind of a scary trend, but it's something that we're noticing and that we're really having to be proactive about in our own classrooms to make sure that our students feel supported and that we're connecting them uh, to the resources uh, to help them uh, so they can successfully complete our programs, get those master's degrees, uh, bachelor's degrees or whatever, and uh, get better mental health. And that shows up in our data too, just the fact that Gen Z respondents were, were far more likely to, to cite mental health uh, than yeah. any, other, any other topic. You know, one, I, one, oh, go on, sorry. No, 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 you go ahead. Well, I was gonna say, it's, it's a completely different topic, but I noticed it, I was thinking about my students. I noticed it in the, in the chat, uh, one, I'm, I'm forgetting your name, so I apologize, but one person uh, mentioned, you know, what about uh, election workers, election volunteers? And, and during um, 20, uh, the 2020 election, uh, in, in, at least in the city of Boston and around us like Newton and things like that, there was actually a shortage of election workers. And so, and I talked to my class about how election workers, you know, traditionally have been, uh, you know, it's skewed a little bit older, oftentimes retirees who are volunteering as election workers. And this could be a chance to have kind of a multi-generational force of election workers. And I was thrilled that so many of my students volunteered and they sent me photographs and it was truly multi-generational, um, you know, at all the different precincts. And that was fun to see. That's wonderful. Um, I, you know, we've been, we've been heartened to, to hear similar stories of those who are, um, you know, whether it be like Women League of Voters who are rallying to go into schools and support teachers um, and help 
get people registered to vote. Um, Third Act, which we mentioned earlier, Bill McKibben has a great program called um, Seniors for Seniors, where he's mobilizing seniors to go in and help graduating seniors from high school register to vote. Uh, he has another, another program called um, Fossils for Fossils, uh, Fossils Against Fossil Fuels. And uh, so he clearly has some, a good marketing team and we could probably leverage some of his sayings. Um, but I do think that there's a way in which um, an asset, uh, a huge um, a huge asset of the older population is a deep belief in um, in the system of voting. They vote. They care about these topics. I think young people are mobilizing out there, but um, I think highly skeptical of participating in the existing system. So once again, I think by bridging the generational divide um, and hearing stories of older generations, understanding why it's so important to vote and then having that connection be part of bringing them into the mix. Um, Without that, we're missing a, a key part of how change can happen in our country. So I think that's that's really critical. Yeah. Yeah. And it, yeah I'm, I'm so glad you raised the Seniors for Seniors program that uh, Third Act is doing. It, we need more commonsensical, scalable ideas like that, um, where it's easy for people to understand. Um, I think the other thing that that is needed is, is to move beyond pilot projects. There are so many wonderful things. I, I could cite dozens of examples of great ideas that are happening at a very small scale through, throughout the country. But what we've lacked is um, a, a whole community uh, or, or a whole metropolitan area that is dedicated to uh, building these generational bridges, putting people together and co-generational action. And, you know, that can sound uh, overly ambitious and utopian, but I, I think of what Singapore's managed to do. They poured 3 billion Singaporean dollars, about 2.4 billion US dollars into the city of, you know, really just four, five million people to create what they've been describing as a kampong for all ages, using the Malay word for village. And I, I'd like to see a compound for all ages in Boston or Oakland or Cleveland. And, uh, and then I'd like to see how the residents of that locale respond to this very same survey. <laughs> and hopefully it'll be even more optimistic than, than the numbers that we're seeing. You know, on that topic, Mark, you know, one of the things, and I did not run this, this, uh, the Experience Corps research, that was actually my phenomenal advisor, Nancy Merle Hall at Washington University in St. Louis. But one of the, the facts that I remember related to what you just said is that by having the older uh, volunteers go into the schools and work with these kids K through third grade, helping them with their reading, is by physically being in those schools and seeing how hard the teachers are working and, and, and spending time with these kids and, and seeing what their lives are like, they stated that they were more likely to support uh, school bond referendas, like things that affect the kids, but not the older adults. So just that contact, but not like Eunice, like you said, not just throwing people together in a room, but it was intentional contact that, that, you know, that had processes involved or whatever you want to say, um, that was done well, then that led to changed thinking and, and thinking more about the future of others. Yeah. Um, it makes me think about uh, there have been some comments in the in the chat box about national service, AmeriCorps, AmeriCorps seniors. Um, at, at some level, Encore's roots are, are embedded in national service. You'd be hard pressed to find two, two bigger fans of national service than Mark and myself. Um, and we recently put out a grant opportunity called Generation Serving Together uh, just to, to put out there the idea that one major place where older and younger can come together and make a huge difference is through national service. Um, we have two uh, we have two parts of national service: AmeriCorps, which is traditionally younger people, and then AmeriCorps Seniors, which was designed for older adults, um, all to go out there and do national service. They're often working in the same communities, sometimes even in the same building, um, or have offices or across the hall from one another, but rarely do they come together and do service together. Um, so this grant incentive was to see if we could actually spur, uh, stir the pot around age integrating national service. Um, we were really heartened to see the response of um, organizations that put in a proposal, described incredible co-generational work happening out there. Um, there's definitely appetite for that to happen. 
uh, a lot of the projects were kind of Cal, what you're talking about, um, how to bring in older adults to work alongside um, brand new teachers um, and or social workers and or mental health workers or disaster relief, like name the topic, but that there would be a way for older and younger if they could work side by side to both support early career growth, as well as leverage the skill and experience of an older person, and then together serve a community that was also multi generational so a lot of deeply layered work. Um, that's quite exciting and. Um, I wonder, Mark, if you might talk a little bit about uh, the experiment we did during the pandemic on Vaccine Corps um, and its ties to national service. Yes, well, uh, we, we did an intergenerational uh, Vaccine Corps uh, focused on Northern California that uh, was responsible for 45,000 uh, vaccines being administered. And just a very powerful example of how uh, retired health professionals, doctors, nurses, other health professionals could come together with young people who brought their organizing skills and, and uh, analytic talents to, uh, to get something urgent done. And, you know, there's so much uh, rightly uh, focus on, on the work together, like the vaccine core and the number of vaccinations, or, you know, as you both talked about experience core, um, the gains in reading for kids by the third grade, which was a hallmark of of that program, but uh, to go back to the mental health um, uh, priority that young people put out in this survey, in a lot of ways, these programs were mental health programs <laughs> under the guise of, in case of experience, we're being a reading program. This is a story that uh, I never tire of, of telling, although I think everybody I tell it to <laughs> is tired of me telling, but it, it was uh, from one of the experience core members I, I met early on who talked about um, waking up on a on a cold gray Philadelphia February day, uh, feeling depressed, and decided not to go into the school and um, stayed in bed. And only um, uh, after a while, just started thinking about how disappointed the children would be at that school. And she um, forced herself out of bed, forced herself to get dressed, forced herself to take the bus to school. And she's hanging up her coat in this old 1920 school bu building on the wall when she feels these two little arms coming up behind her and says, somebody loves me. <laughs> and, um, you know, we now know that th these kinds of connections are critical to fighting off loneliness and despair and um, mental health challenges when they, they come. And so I think in a way, this whole idea is, is a mental health initiative along with being so many other things. Yeah, I think that's right. Often when you have um, a really robust multi-generational team working together on a solution, in addition to getting great work done, um, you'll hear that uh, that community described as uh, an extended family, as a place that feels more like community and home. Um, and there's a sense of belonging, which is deeply tied to your sense of mental well-being. And so I think we've all experienced that um, firsthand. Yeah. Um, yeah one, one of, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say one of the interwoven messages that's coming across all of this research is the way in which mutual benefit that older and younger people can help each other uh, intertwines with collective impact, the, the things that they can do to help people of all ages, and they're uh, inextricably intertwined. Yeah, I've been actually thrilled to see lots of comments, um, both about the word cogenerate, which we've been using, um, as well as people just using the word cogenerate as they've been uh, as they've been typing into the chat box in the Q&A. Uh, this is a word that we started to use, I don't know, Mark, maybe a year, a year ago or something like that, um, because we felt uh, when we talked about intergenerational work, which is really important, there's a lot of noise in there, um, good noise, but about a lot of it has been um, about a one directional, um, older helping youngers or youngers helping olders and, um, collaboration happening side by side. Um, the area that we're really interested in and that this research tackled was the collaboration, the co-creation, um, the coming together of older and younger to, to tackle something. So uh, we've been leaning into the use of that word just to clarify that subset of the larger universe. And it's been really fun to see people pick it up, use it um, and understand 
the sort of beauty even of it coming from an energy term that talks about sort of um, different types of power coming together to create something new and we think better. So um, that's been that's been a lot of fun. Um, all right, I'm gonna take one last look as we round um, the corner on our conversation to see if there are any other burning questions. Uh, Mark or Cal, have you seen anything that is jumping out at you? You know, one thing that jumped, I, I saw a lot of discussion um, on even the names of some of the generations, for example, the silent generation. And, you know, it's, this was something we discussed. And even, even if we should use the names of, of all of these generations, should we give them new names? And, you know, ultimately we decided to go with the more prevailing names, which come from the Pew Research Center, because they, they tend to be seen as the experts uh, when it comes to generational research. That's not to say that these are perfect names. Um, and, and just because someone cleanly falls into, just by their age, into a generation does not actually describe who you are as a person. So this is a really nice way for us, or a simple way, I should say, for us to show trends in general uh, by age, but there's a lot of other ways to cut the data. There's different names we could choose to use, and we're definitely open to your input. Yeah. Um, well, and I also think that there's obviously been a lot written also about the limits of a generational or um, kind of cohorting of age group. I mean, it's absolutely as with anything, um, it's important to, I think a lot of the work of Encore has been focused on um, looking at a, a subset of our population to, you know, for our first 20 plus years of the older population, because um, without a focus there, um, the talents and skills and experience of older adults has been greatly discarded. Um, and when we look at young people, a similar uh, discounting of of what seems to be lack of experience, but is actually just a different kind of experience and perspective. Um, so we have, you know, we, we use the terms that are out there because they are convenient in certain ways, but also want to acknowledge the complexity um, of what it means to uh, to create that that short bridge that John Paul talks about. Um, uh, Sarah just put in the chat box an interesting book to, to read about this is from Bobby Duffy, uh, The Generation Myth. So might recommend that if you haven't looked into it. Um, all right, Mark, any final words before I, I move us into closing? Well, it just that, uh, you know, when we think about co-generation, we think about it as against the idea of degeneration of this multi-generational society collapsing on itself, uh, or alternatively, the potential for regeneration. And we're conv convinced that the road to regeneration runs through co-generation. It can embody, symbolize, show us how to come together in ways where everybody benefits. Uh, that's a wonderful place to end. So I want to thank all of you for joining us. Uh, Cal, you in particular for your critical role in this research and today's conversation. Um, and once again, just want to give a special shout out to those who made this work possible. AmeriCorps Seniors, the M Center for Excellence, the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, the John Templeton Foundation, and of course, NORC at the University of Chicago. Um, we'll be sending a list of resources and a recording of this conversation in a follow-up email, which we'll also link to the report in case you haven't seen it yet and this whetted your appetite and you want to dig into it. Um, and I also want to put in a quick plug. If you want to see inspiring co-generation in action. I want to invite all of you to join us next Wednesday on June 29th at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern for Encore's signature virtual event of the year. It's called the Gen to Gen Innovation Showcase. Uh, I think Sarah's putting, yep, uh, Duncan already put in a registration link in the chat box. There will be an incredible performance from an intergenerational New Orleans brass band. They're amazing. There'll be a special welcome from our friend and collaborator, Eric Liu, CEO of Citizen University, who has used the degeneration, regeneration, cogeneration frame before. Um, there'll be a showcase of innovative cogenerational work happening across the country and a chance for you to participate in the community building practice of mutual aid. So you won't wanna miss it. We thank you so much for being here today, for asking great questions, for digging into this important research. We hope you'll use it. We hope you'll spread it. Um, and we hope you'll raise more questions that you think we and others should dig into. Um, we need more research to be done, that's for sure. Um, so have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thanks for being with us.